I mean, it was a really small team that worked really, really hard on a very specific vision that they had. And, man, incredible that they were able to pull it off, truly. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Halo 2 Artifacts. In today's episode, The Social Revolution, we're covering the online and social features of Halo 2, which would go on to become not only franchise-defining, but also set the standard for many games to come. Joining me once again is Max Hoberman. Hey, Andy. Nice to see you again. It's great to see you again, too, Max. And in order to get the full story here, we are so excited to also bring in Sam Charchian, who was on the Xbox Live team during this time, working alongside Max and Bungie to bring these features to life in Halo 2. Sam, so special to have you with us here. Hi, thanks for having me on. It's great to see you again, Max. What's up, Sam? It's been a while, hasn't it? Only like, you know, 15 years or something like that. I know, it's been way too long. We were just chatting beforehand a little bit. As it turns out, it had been even longer since Max and Sam had last caught up. Uh, last time I talked to Sam was probably 2004, 2005, I would guess. Yeah. So wow. A few. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. So this ridiculous. is cool. This is exciting. Getting the band back together again. Absolutely. So some of you have likely already done the math, but this recording was Max and Sam's first time catching up since just after Halo 2 shipped. So for this episode, you and I are lucky to have a front row seat as they exchange war stories on what it took to deliver Halo 2's legendary online features to the world. I suggested when Andy was asking me, you know, who else might be good to talk to. Yeah. And I was thinking people that were kind of right there with us during Halo 2, you know, on that crazy wild ride. You were yep. the very first person that came to mind. And, and the person I thought would have the, in some ways, the best sort of holistic view of the, of the world. <laughs> well, from the Xbox side, for sure. Yeah. I mean, but yeah. Bungie was such a secretive group. Like, yeah, yeah, I can represent. You can do that Bungie, part right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. But from the the rest of the Microsoft perspective, um, yeah. you were just the first person that came to mind. Yeah, thank you. Anyway, I thought you were you were a good uh, person to bring up, so hope, hope you don't mind. Cool. I'm, <laughs> no, I'm super happy to be here. I love that stuff, yeah. and uh, it was a really fun. Uh, it was a really fun time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sam, you have a great story that you shared with me about how you got into games and you'd, of course, go on to work on not only Halo 2, but you've also got credits on Halo 3, yep. Years of War 1, uh, Mass Effect, and more, which, by the way, is an outrageous greatest hits lineup. Yeah. Um, but I'd love for you to share the story of how you started working on games and ultimately working with Bungie on Halo 2. Uh, sure. In 1997, I actually started at Microsoft, long before they were doing anything as cool as an Xbox. Um, and I was working on email technology. So I was working on Outlook and Exchange, um, the underlying technologies that work underneath all of that. I did that for a few years, but I was really, in my heart, a hardcore gamer. I was just all over the game industry and huge playing all the time at home. And I really wanted to get closer to video games. We started hearing about, you know, these rumors about Microsoft making this cool new Xbox, which I couldn't be I actually thought my friends at, at, at work were trolling me. Like, we're making a game console? No, we're not. Come on, really? Mm -hmm. Microsoft's going to make a game console? And, you know, it turns out Microsoft was really worried about the PS2 because it was a pretty powerful computer and it was going to be in people's living room. And uh, we found that to be a threat. Uh, so uh, sure enough, it was true. And as soon as I possibly could, I made my way over and applied for a, a job on the Xbox team. Uh, they were looking for somebody who would help them interface with their game developers because these are all Microsoft guys mm -hmm. and they know how to build software and they, they kind of understand game technology, but they don't really understand what game developers need from us especially with regards to something like Xbox Live, which was a totally, completely different beast than building a console. Building a huge online service is a totally different thing. So sure. um, they really hired me to go out, talk to all the game developers that we had, and find out what it is they wanted Xbox Live to be. So right away on the job, like first thing they did was, you need to go talk to Bungie. We had just shipped the original Xbox when I joined and Halo was like just setting the video game world on fire. I mean, everyone prior to that was saying, you can't make a FPS on a console because you need a keyboard and mouse. You just simply cannot replicate that with a controller. There wasn't a long track record of shooters being a, a healthy genre and a big genre on console. I specifically remember back then people saying this will never work. And there was a lot of debate about if that was true or not. And we really didn't know. I mean, genuinely, I think people did not know until Bungie went out and proved to the world that it can be done and be done well. 
Um, and so the world is on fire with Halo just like absolutely crushing it. And so here I was, this guy who's never shipped a video game, never worked on a video game. And like first day on the job, they're like, you need to go meet with Jason Jones over at Halo and, uh, and you know, get, get in touch with those guys and just sort of build a relationship with them. And I, I was like really intimidated because Jason Jones is, you know, he's, he yeah. is Halo. Like he mm -hmm. is the guy who is Bungie and is Halo. And here I am, nobody. And, you know, I've got a meeting with Jason Jones. And so I remember going over there the first time and Jason was nice enough to sit down with me for a couple of minutes. And we discussed what we're, you know, what I was doing and what they were doing a little bit, you know, after like five minutes, we basically, we got up and he brought me over to meet Max and said, this is the guy you need to be talking to. Max Hoberman is, is your guy. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's really the, the shortest version of how I can get you uh, up to speed on how Max and I met and what my background was heading up into that. That, that's a that's really interesting, Sam. I, I've never heard your version of that before. I don't know if you're aware of this, but the very first. So before we even dove into the proper episode recording, Sam and Max immediately and unsurprisingly started catching up and exchanging stories. So we, of course, kept the mics rolling. We start here with a quick story from 2002, with the first meeting between Bungie and Xbox Live. The very first meeting with the Xbox Live team, uh, Jason came to me and Chris Butcher, who was the uh, engineering lead for all the, mm -hmm. all the online stuff. Yeah. And uh, he said he wanted us to join for this first meeting with the Xbox Live team, which I assume you had facilitated. And uh, I don't know if you're aware of this part of it, but Jason actually told uh, Butcher and I that we we're not allowed to speak in that meeting. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. Just follow his lead and we're not allowed to talk. So I bet, <laughs> I bet that meeting happened prior to my being hired. It, it might have been. Because Live was already under development, and I bet... And, and those kinds of meetings were probably happening all the time inside Xbox where they're starting to talk to developers and they realized we don't really know how to even talk to these people. Um, and that's why they, they opened the position for me. I'm, I'm guessing, but that, that would make sense with everything I'd heard. Yeah, yeah, because it seems like you would have been the one that facilitated it. I remember work, working with you after that really closely, but here's what happened. So we go to this meeting. Jason, Jason is clearly just making shit up, like pulling everything out of his butt. He has lots of ideas, but there's no there's no plan or anything. Meanwhile, I've been I've been working on planning the online feature set for, you know, for quite some time, thinking about it anyway. So after that meeting, I sat down, I pulled the butcher aside, we chatted a little bit. He he agreed with my assessment that Jason basically had his hands full because the campaign was on fire already and uh and that really butcher and I should you know, free Jason up to uh, focus on other things. So uh, we actually went, we pulled uh, Jason aside and we were like, hey, hey, Jason. So uh, after that first meeting we had with the live team, we actually have a recommendation. Our recommendation is that you don't need to come to those meetings anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we got it. We're going to take it from here. And he was like, uh, really? Are you guys sure? We're like, yeah, 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 don't worry about it. We got it. And that was it. That was the wow. last me last meeting that Jason ever had with the uh, live team. I don't know if you ever wondered why Jason wasn't involved in any of that. Maybe a little sales pitch here and there, but uh, yeah. for the most part, Butcher and I just took it and ran with it from that point forward. Yeah, I never knew. And I think got introduced to you like right after that, probably. Interesting. Yeah, and, the, and what happened is from that point forward, we engaged with the live team. I actually remember the very first meeting where we sat down and they showed us their visual, they had in visual format, their roadmap their feature roadmap. And I'm almost positive you facilitated that first meeting. Yeah. Um, I remember the crazy roadmap, which was all over the map. And I remember you giving me context, explaining that really there's a bunch of executives and everyone has their own like personal wish list. Yeah. And uh, give me some context for that crazy map. And then the first thing I did is I went back and I uh, looked at it. We talked about it and we came back and said, well, regardless of this roadmap, here's our priorities <laughs> and yeah. scratched out like two thirds of the uh, roadmap. Do you, you remember that? I don't remember that specifically, but I, I had those meetings with like almost all of the important game developers around like North America, really. I mean, yeah. I was off at Epic giving them these same talks and I was up at Bioware and I mm -hmm. mean, I was everywhere trying to get feedback from developers and getting them plugged into what we were doing with live. And it was a crazy time. I mean, I, at Epic, especially, they really hated it. Um, Tim Sweeney told me it was the stupidest fucking thing he'd ever heard. Um, mainly, and his two issues with it were really that one, we were charging money. These, and put it in context, they were the guys who made Unreal, and Unreal was on top of the multiplayer world on PC at the time. That was the multiplayer competitive game on PC. And they're like, hey, it's free to play on PC. You think people are going to pay to play on your service, you know, X, $50 a year when they can play for free on the PC, and you have zero customers, and you think you're going to be competitive? The other part that they hated was that it was we were not allowing people with dial-up 
and dial up was still super, super common oh, back yeah. then. Like probably more than half of the people were still on dial up. And he's like, you're not going to let anyone unless they have broadband. That's stupid. You're, you know, you're cutting off more than half of your audience. And they thought it was dumb. I mean, they liked the overall feature set, I think, but they overall, they, you know, they thought it was just not going to happen, not going to work as a service. Yeah, Max and I were actually discussing it in the first episode. I think there's documentation that says that only 30% of the U.S. had access to broadband, broadband. in those pre-Halo yeah. 2 days. Yeah. yeah, it was a huge factor in, in my designs. Uh, it was a huge factor was thinking about broadband penetration and how do you, what do we estimate? And re, I don't know if you recall, Sam, I had to, I did a whole bunch of modeling for matchmaking and wait mm-hmm. times and all this stuff. And I, yep. and all of that had to have a foundation of what we thought at launch, what we thought broadband penetration would actually look like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, there's one other thing that we might want to touch on before we leave this, which was there was a huge, like everyone involved thought Halo 1 was this, you know, massive, massive hit. All these LAN parties were happening. And here it is a year later and we're shipping Xbox Live and everyone's thinking, why the hell don't we take Halo 1 and port it to Xbox Live? And that was definitely pitched to Bungie and Bungie was a hard hell no on that. And I don't know if we want to like go into that story at all. We should. I think, I mean, I've seen it re- referenced in a few different articles as like, yeah, the, the Halo 1.5 was, was on the table. Right. Do you have much to say on that, Max? Do you remember that coming up and being a topic? No comment. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 no, I actually, I, I have vague memories of that. I don't remember the all the rationale, but uh, I think that there was a lot that Bungie was not happy about, um, you know, because we, we really had to shoehorn the multiplayer for Halo 1 in at the last minute. So there was a lot about the the game that Bungie was not happy about the the game design, and there was a lot about the implementation that wouldn't work. But I, I suspect the real reason is we were just hyper focused on Halo Two, yeah, and all all the really crazy ambitious things we were doing. We were already overstretched, like like seriously yep. overstretched. I was talking to Andy about that a little bit. How UI engineering ended up being the uh, bottleneck on so many features got cut because we couldn't even handle the UI implementation right. or the in-game sort of integration in the in the game shell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I don't remember much more. It wasn't a, it was not a topic of hot debate within Bungie. Yeah, I think sure. it was a pretty quick hard no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't my decision. I don't know if you're aware of this, Sam. I, I wasn't in charge of everything multiplayer online for the first like, I don't know, maybe certainly the first year of Halo 2. So some of that probably oh. preceded my uh, decision making ability yeah. in, the, in that sense <laughs> i did not know that i figured you're always the guy so no, no you have to listen to the first episode and you'll you'll hear the backstory ah i will do that <laughs> in just a moment we'll start to dive back into max's design documents and use them as a guide as we hear the stories of how features like parties matchmaking clans halo 2's ranking system and more would revolutionize multiplayer gaming Max, there's an internal large-scale multiplayer document of yours from September 2003, which I don't think has been seen, and I think it paints the picture pretty well. It reads, Halo 2 will be playable on the internet, which, although it provides new opportunities, also poses daunting challenges. Playing competitive multiplayer games on the internet is not an inherently friendly experience. The task of shaping this experience into a dynamic, friendly, intelligent community falls on our shoulders. It's pretty amazing to read something like that because it, it seems like you guys understood the challenges right off the bat. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd been, you know, running the uh, Myth games, uh, you know, BungieNet um, had been, you know, very educational. So, so mm-hmm. you know, internet gaming and competitive multiplayer gaming was, was certainly not new to us. Uh, although it's funny to hear that back because I didn't write language like what you just read for internal consumption. I, I only wrote things like what you just read specifically so that Sam could shuttle them to the Xbox Live team. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had like an external audience for some of that stuff that uh, mm-hmm. I, I had to I had to sort of bring along on the journey that didn't have the same inherent understanding of, of what the world was like that we had internally at Bungie, I would say. Mm-hmm. Like I remember I had, I had a conversation very, very early on, Halo One Days even, before Xbox Live launched with um, someone who was the, ex- the going to be the Xbox Live producer, although by the time we were working on Halo 2, she was no longer part of the group. And I remember having a conversation with her, and she was talking all about how we're going to handle griefers and you know people that are cheating, problematic. And I remember her solution that she proposed was that they would create an email account, a gen- some kind of generic email account, and anyone that had 
issues would just need to email this email account. <laughs> oh, no, no. Like griefer, griefer at Microsoft.com or something. So, so I remember I was like, okay. I started thinking, I was like, all right, let, let's chase this down a little further. I was like, well, what, what's going to happen to one of those emails when they show up? Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, you know, we'll respond to it. I was like, who's going to check this email account? She's like, I, I don't know. I think maybe I will. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. So, but it, it was just, I think from, from the get-go, I sort of understood that there were many people, maybe not everyone, but there were many people inside of Microsoft that were involved in Xbox Live that really just didn't understand the fundamental nature of online, especially competitive multiplayer gaming. Yeah. And they didn't understand the scale of uh, the what it could be also. I don't know, Sam, if any of your experience echoed that. No, I mean, it's to- you're totally right on. And I mean, the best part about it is the Xbox team was pretty well aware of the fact that they didn't really know. Yeah. And that's that was the gap I was meant to bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and to be honest, I didn't know either. I was really relying on people like you yep. to tell us what the heck we were supposed to build. And then I would go sell that internally as this is what we need to do, um, you know, for our game development community and what we, where the service needs to go. Yeah, awesome. One of my favorite lines that I have read across maybe every design document you sent me is from that that same document. And it reads, no game to date has created a true online community on a console. Halo 2 will change this. Yeah. That was the goal. Yeah, uh, we we did. Yeah, we didn't want to create a, we didn't want to create an environment that was just a, a anonymous, you know, competitive gaming scene. We wanted to, we wanted to create an environment. I wanted to create an environment that helped facilitate friendships for people. Right? It's, it's your hobby. It's where you hang out, and uh, you know that, that's always inherently difficult when there's a competitive aspect to it. You're you're sort of setting yourselves up for some extra challenges, but it doesn't mean it can't be done. And we were we were adamant that we were going to do it, and I think we pulled it off. Yeah. There's one final line in that document too that makes it seem like there was a grasp between your teams on just how important this feature set could be if it was done right. It reads, "The end result will be an online experience that not only is the absolute best there is on a console, but that surpasses even the best online multiplayer experience." In PC games, yeah, you know, at the time the the PC online experience was uh, was pretty brutal, right? They had there there were technical hurdles to overcome. There were just you know finding games could be challenging with server browsers, and then you'd you'd often be at the mercy of you know whoever was hosting the server and their their capricious whims and difficulty you know finding friends and you know and there were no there were no systemic ways for tracking your know, reputation or anything like that. Like it was the wild west in a lot of ways. And the wild west meant a lot of people sort of fell victim, you know, there were a lot of victims, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, yeah, we were, you know, I, th- I think the person, the company that was doing it best back then was probably Blizzard or not probably, definitely. Um, there was definitely a lot that Blizzard was doing with Battle.net, you know, obviously on PC mm-hmm. that inspired us. And there were, there were aspects of that that were jumping off points. Um, but we felt, I felt that we could do better and we could do better than even the Battle.net experience on PC at the time. Yeah, I'm glad you brought it up because Battle.net is one of the references uh, right here in this document. And there are a few other references to games that were getting things right in terms of gameplay specifically, uh, such as Counter-Strike, Battlefield 1942 is also listed, also SOCOM. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is back in September 2003 where you were looking at how several games had started to tackle the unfriendly nature of competitive online games, but that no one had really gotten it exactly right just yet. Yeah, I mean, that that was my view at the time. It was, you know, looking around and there was just nothing you could look at and say, this is it, you know, this is what we need to be. Everything had like gaping gaping problems, gaping issues. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Sam, if... You you just trusted me. It sounds like well, I <laughs> or trusted did. me and others. <laughs> I mean, you have to you have to put yourself in my shoes. Like I'd never shipped a game, and here I am supposed to represent game developers, and I'm walking into Bungie, and it's like you guys were sort of like you know not touchable by me. I didn't want to tell you guys what to do. I didn't want to I yeah. didn't want to contradict anything <laughs> you said. Like I had no business like doing anything other than asking the occasional question, understanding what you were making, and trying to drive that forward internally. Like I yeah. I was not the game designer here. That was you. And that was great. I mean, it, it gave us all the uh, all the runway and support we needed. So yeah, that was yeah. awesome. It worked well, clearly. Right. Let's go ahead and jump into some of these the features in depth. I think the document that provides the most insight is a document titled Live Postmortem. 
um, which was written November 13th, 2004 is the creation date on the document. So just a few days after launch. And it's a it's an only partially finished what was planned to be an article. Uh, but I think it's a great framework for for how much of an architectural and philosophical change that you guys uh, were introducing. Yeah, you know, I, I was I was definitely aware, very aware that what we were doing was was quite revolutionary and, and had a lot of, uh, you know, the impact, could, you know, sort of earth shaking impact, so to speak. And I remember at one point after we shipped, I kind of put pen to paper, realizing that, you know, it would, it would probably be wise to capture sort of the story of, of how this all came about. And I put pen to paper, but, but I didn't get very far. I think it might've been like sit down for 20 minutes and type something. And then I never actually returned to it, sadly. Um, but it is a fascinating snapshot in time because you see what where my head was at right after we shipped it and before we really knew you know, whether that impact would actually be felt. I'm going to go ahead and open it because there's a few lines that I don't even have captured that I think, yeah, it's like finding a a half written treasure map um, because you're about to in the document you're about to dive into so much more um and such a tease it, it is it, it pretty much ends with thus we embarked upon a much more challenging journey i mean <laughs> you are a tease I, I don't know how they i don't know how well, we can end you, something like, like that you and like frank and maybe one other are the only people that have actually seen that because i never shared that yeah wow it's, uh, it's one of my favorite documents, and I think the best place to begin is the opening line. And I'll go ahead and read it. We had one primary goal when designing the online interface for Halo 2. We wanted to perfectly reproduce the LAN party experience, that incredible experience of playing Halo on your living room couch yep. with your friends. When, when I started, I felt like, okay, there's something magical that's happening in, you know, with Halo 1 multiplayer. Mm -hmm. and, and so many people are discovering how much fun it is to, you know, to have a, these LAN parties. And it, it wasn't new to me because, you know, and, and others had kind of grown up. That, that was the way you played multiplayer mm -hmm. right back in the day. So, you know, I kind of grew up my, my whole college uh, apartment. I had four roommates and, you know, we wired our, our apartment and played Marathon, mm -hmm. Bungie's first shooter, you know, multiplayer obsessively. So... That land, that land party was not new to me, but so many people felt like discovered it for the first time. Mm -hmm. You might have, Andy, discovered it for the first time. Yeah, it was all Halo 1. <laughs> yeah, and it worked so well that when we were thinking about taking Halo online, it just seemed like a natural thing for me, which is like, why don't? what if we could take, essentially virtualize this experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I even came up with a slogan, so to speak, for that um, internal at Bungie that I probably leaked out to the live team and others, which we called it the virtual couch because you're virtually playing on the couch, you know, with your friends. You remember that, Sam? The virtual couch? I do. Yeah. I do remember that phrase. Oh, and the virtual couch image, I don't know if you remember, it's step three of the matchmaking screen in Halo 2. Yeah, yeah. Is everyone with an <laughs> Xbox Live communicator in like yes. marine gear sitting on that couch? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, that, I mean, that was kind of the philosophy was that this is such a cool experience playing in a land setting. Why not virtualize it? And, and that really was the guiding light for so much, um, so much of the online design. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's where parties came along, right? I, I had this notion, I was thinking about it, I had this notion that when you think about the LAN party experience um, versus the typical game, you know, server browser, online uh, shooter experience, the typical experience of a LAN party, you fir you decide who you want to play with before you decide what you want to play, yes. right? So you get a bunch of friends together and then you're like, all right, guys, what are we going to play? Right. You have that conversation. But the way that you played PC games at the time online was different. First, you find a server where the host has already decided who he wants to play. So you essentially decide what you want to play. And then, you know, you struggle to try and get your friends into the same server and on the same team and everything else. And I really felt like it should be in order to replicate that LAN party experience, it should be reversed. And step one should be decide who you want to play with. And that was where that was actually the genesis of the idea of parties. Right form a party, form this, again, this sort of virtual grouping, and then go into mm -hmm. deciding, you know, custom games or matchmaking, whatever, decide on your activity. One thing that I think is often overlooked in parties too, is that whenever you went to the playlist select screen or a custom game screen, you were automatically hosting a party. There was never a step of create party. It was always a default joinable state where as soon as you were playing this game in any capacity, you, you were hosting a party. Yeah, yeah, you were yeah, you were always a, a party of one, and it's just a question of whether or not you had other people. The, trying to design the interface for parties was monumentally difficult. Um, 
just, hell, just trying to explain the concept of parties to the Xbox Live team was yeah. monumentally difficult. At one point, we only we only got over the hump on that when we built that little interactive demo. Um, do you remember that, Sam? I don't know. We, we had we we had Joe Staten in there. And we had Marty, and it was this like fake little land party showing how all these systems are going to work together. And uh, you, we had it with a controller. So we, we had a meeting you facilitated, and we, yep. we sat in front of a bunch of people, and we pulled up, and it had Joe being like, "Hey, Marty!" And it, it really yep. was. If you look at, I still have the, I still have the video. I can share it with you. Oh, Andy. you should share that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's become a legendary video because it eventually leaked. Oh, oh, there you it's, go. It's okay, out there yeah. now. Yep. Yeah, you have Joe and Marty, and there's grunt voices, yep. and you guys are about to play Blizzard. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and what and it was, it was all fakery. It was all. Yeah, it was all uh, fake, but you know, it was all triggered. Yeah, uh, a little scripted scene, but it, it communicated what the cohesive experience was of of being in a party and matchmaking and starting matchmaking together and the fr- pop up friends list, all these innovations we had, and messaging your friend or joining your friend off of that list. Everything we were doing was brand new, and it was just. I, I remember the the party aspects of it, especially Sam. Mm-hmm. The live team just could not wrap their head around it until that video came out. Yep. So Andy, we definitely have to share share a link to that. When that came out, though, it was like it was like a light bulb going off for everybody. We'll do even better than a link. Here's some quick snippets from that original Xbox Live Parties prototype video featuring Joe Staten, Marty O'Donnell, Dave Canlan, and more. You can watch the original full length video on Dave Canlan's website at canned.land slash Halo Two Party. Dave is the legendary designer behind user interfaces of all the original Halo titles, as well as Destiny. Here's a few moments from the video. Hey Dave, you there? Marty. Hey, who's that with you? Uh, it's Christine, and she's gonna whoop your ass. <laughs> hey, so Dave, what's that movie you were telling me about today? Oh yeah, let me send that to you. So we're getting uh, ahead of ourselves a little bit in this episode, but this prototype video also features a bunch of cut features from Halo 2, including, as you just heard, saved films and file share. Hey, I just got an invite from Joe. Let's hop over. Listen up. The guys from Blizzard just moved in downstairs. They threw down the gauntlet. We all set to give them a little ass-whooping soccer blood gulch anytime. Hey, dudes! You have room for one more crunchy crunch? Jeez, guys, who's the guy with the grunt filter? Let's boot him. Hey, no, wait! So a few extra cool notes here before we move on. One is that you might have caught Joe Staten just now reference soccer on Blood Gulch, and also the idea of a grunt voice mask filter. We'll circle back to these and other features that didn't make the cut throughout the series, but for now, we'll jump back into the conversation on online and social features. What I remember from that, that whole experience is, and I'm sure you remember this as well, Max, Xbox Live 1.0 had just launched like a few months prior. Yeah. You guys, you were especially, Max, were knee deep in trying to design like this party system and all the UI for uh, for the multiplayer and the multiplayer systems. Yeah. Meanwhile, on our side, on the Xbox Live side, we were beginning to develop what we called Xbox Live 2.0, and we'd already spec'd that out. And we had also spec'd out Xbox Live 3.0. Which, and so like our teams, and these were not small teams of people. These were large groups of, you know, developers, designers, et cetera. And they're all hard at work doing, you know, Xbox Live 2.0. And then Max would come to me and say, hey, here's our vision. We need to do these things that you guys can't support. Like we had no way on live of supporting parties. Like we were like parties have all kinds of technical implications behind the scenes, like around sessions and things that, and joins and invites that it ripples throughout all of live. And so, and it requires like changes to almost every service. And so when, when Max comes to me and says, hey, we want to do this party thing. And like, here's some of the stuff we need. I went to the live team and they're like, get the hell out of here with this stuff. We're busy <laughs> with Xbox Live 2.0 and 3.0. We don't have time to do this stuff. And I'm like, this is for Halo. And like, it's a very compelling system. You really need to like give this some serious thought. And they'd think about it for a day and come back and be like, we're not going to do this. And so I would call Max up and I'd be like, Look, man, they're not willing to like make changes to our entire system around sessions and matchmaking and and invites and joins and everything else. Um, they just don't want to do it. Like those teams are booked and they're booked out for like a year. So like we don't have time to get you on the schedule. And so Max and I would decide we need to get these guys all in a room and show them like nuts to bolts what they're giving up. That's where we would have these meetings and we'd pull in all the executives from the Xbox Live side and say like, here's the vision and here's what you're saying no to to being part of our service. That is always what it took to get them to flip and go, oh, okay, yeah, this is worth it. And it would be you and Butcher 
um, and some of the other key guys. Yep. And we and this happened multiple times. This wasn't like a one-off where we did it once and they just fully signed up. It was as we'd get further down the road, we'd find out some other part of Xbox Live wouldn't work um, with the system. And we'd have to have that same meeting over again because they'd tell me no. And then I'd bring in the big guns, have Bungie come over, and they would always flip and say like yeah we don't want to be the guys who stop this game from shipping <laughs> you know what you know what's funny you just you just made me realize sam it's funny i was telling i was telling andy yesterday that there was no producer for xbox live for inside of inside of bungie for multiplayer online ui none of it i didn't have a producer that was you wasn't it i mean that was you well all right i essentially had to be the producer right but in in, in reality I actually think as it related to the relationship with the Xbox Live team, to a very large extent, you essentially were our producer by extension. Yeah, it felt that way. I, I, could, I couldn't have done what I did without you as a partner and, and guide to help navigate the politics and everything. Yeah. Um, so, so in a sense, I did have a producer. I, I want to revise my earlier statement, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> we had one really kick-ass conference room in Xbox called the Xbox Conference Room. That's, that's where all the heavy lifting got done. Yep. No windows. It was a dark windowless room. I remember it well. <laughs> yeah, it was a dark windowless room. <laughs> <laughs> I remember a lot of meetings with uh, Boyd Molter, yep. who was... He was our development lead. Yeah, one of, if not the top uh, tech lead, right? Engineering yep. lead. I, I remember many meetings with Boyd that you facilitated. So I remember all things you facilitated, all, all the outcome of, of our meetings. And I remember the warnings you would always give me. And I remember Boyd very, very sternly telling me you better be sure about this because it's going to change everything we're doing yeah and then and then i'd be like uh crap all right yep i'm sure it's all good do yeah. it yeah <laughs> so you can imagine how much trouble i had convincing yeah. them to do it like i'm not you guys and we always yeah, called yeah. it bringing in the bungee hammer which kind of has a different word now but it's like that's what it took to get things moved yeah. over there right yeah god the, yeah the, pol the politics of it were uh were pretty monumental um but but i, I don't have any negative thoughts about it because uh, it all worked out in our favor. All right, it did. It was all it was all a, a worthwhile investment. Um, is kind of how I feel about it. Yep, I agree. And ultimately, we did the right things um, to make the game work in within your vision. I believe, anyway. I, yeah. Well, you you guys went above and beyond. You did more because you guys actually implemented backend services for features that we had no choice but to cut. Oh. Uh, I, I felt bad, but at least I was. Clear. Do you remember which ones? I've been... Oh yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about it some later. But yeah, you guys implemented the multi-level tournament system. Oh, I have stories about tournaments. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You guys implemented a much richer feature set for clans in-game integration that I had spec'd out. You guys implemented the uh, unit stats. If you, my personal oh, pet feature, if you recall, yeah, which, yeah, to this yeah. day nobody in the world knows what it is that hasn't actually seen those old specs because yeah. nobody's ever done it. You guys implemented. I'm sure there was more, but those are just off the top of my head. All those things that we sadly had to cut from the game or scale back. I don't think we ever shipped tournaments for you, though. I think that got killed on our side. Maybe it did in concert with yours. It, it, but it, it, was... it got killed, and then somebody went and patented the uh, multi-level tournament idea. Oh, jeez. Yeah. What was the what was the unit thing you just mentioned? Unit stats. I probably needed a better name, but unit well, stats. What were the unit stats? I can't spoil the secret. That was my little quiz I did on the uh, on Twitter, Andy. My my bonus question is asking: Does anyone know what the hell unit stats are? And no one this day, no one, no one's no answered one has it. Has ever answered that question? I don't know if Sam remembers. I I want to say it was like your. <laughs> It was like your squad. It was like the stats pertaining to your squad that you played with or something like that. Yeah, Sam's getting warmer, getting warmer. It's like your group of friends and you're getting warmer. All right, I right, remember right. talking about it a lot. I don't remember exactly what it was. So I'll give you, Sam, this will be real quick between us, a little sidebar. Okay. As you just heard, this was originally an off the record sidebar with Max and Sam, but I managed to convince them to let us leave it in the episode. So... Do you remember how there was a there were stats tracked and leaderboards tracked for every Zuid, every Xbox user ID? Yes, of course. Do you remember I, ha I had this I had this notion that was what if you could do that not just for individual Zuids, yeah. but you could do it for every permutation Station of groups a, of Zuids, groups of Zuids up to a maximum count, yep. and then present that back to the players. So Andy, for instance, imagine that you and I, my, your your Xbox user ID plus my Xbox user ID equals a unique identifier. Sure. And you could imagine that you you tapped into all the stats that we did, leaderboards and anything else. Imagine you, you could go in there and you could say, I wonder what my performance is like when Max and I play together. Yeah. And boom, you pull it up. Just pick two players, three players, four players, any combination. And go any look combination. At, and go look at the stats for any sort of arbitrary combination of players up to a limit. And it, it was all it was all built on the backbone of the existing uh, infrastructure. 
I really, I really wanted that. <laughs> this is what, exactly what Blizzard would go on to do with StarCraft Two. Um, oh, did they? It's exactly what they do. Oh, it's a, a yeah, and on the back end, it's a string of unique user IDs in succession is the team ID. And you can always look at your history with that group, that player. Yeah, yeah. Uh, see, I wasn't aware anyone had done it. So yeah, that was, that was going to be a big innovation that I wanted um, in uh, Halo 2 is one, one of the features that got cut I was super bummed about. Yeah. I could see the live team being really resistant to that feature too, because you know our, our leaderboards were pretty well bound by the number of players and the number of games. And oh, yeah, yeah. you can I mean, easily like, understand how many rows you're going to have in those leaderboards. I had a real difficult conversation with because of the scalability issues. I think exactly. it was Eric Neustadter, Neustadter? or something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. It would, would he have been the man? Probably. I mean, he's, he was kind of running the back end service and yeah, owned yeah. that. Yeah. I had a real difficult conversation about that where he laid out all the realities to me and I did the thing that I typically did, which was, well, <laughs> then fix it. <laughs> fi- yeah. Figure it out. <laughs> I wasn't a jerk about it, but uh, no. I was, I was fairly uncompromising. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds like one. That does sound super familiar, and I could see where they would say no to that, um, and then relent after after meeting with you and Butcher and whoever they else. They relented, and then we had to cut the feature because we couldn't implement all the UI for yeah. it. it so so see, bummed. and this this ended up biting biting Bungie in the ass because like they would derail all these things you guys went in and fought <laughs> for, like the units and tournaments. It would totally derail the team because they're working on other stuff, and then you'd cut the feature later. And this this brewed some bad blood by the time Halo 3 was being made. There were some people on the live team who were not real thrilled with Bungie. Yeah, the only thing I can say to, to our credit and to my credit is I was always clear about what our priorities were and what was likely to get cut. Because I, I remember telling them that they would impl- implement tournaments at your own risk because we're likely to cut it. So at least yeah. I was honest about that. And, and we cut it too, like before it even got to you guys. I, I, we did. We would do spec review meetings all the time where someone's developing a new feature and we'd basically open up the meeting where he's going to reveal it. Um, to anybody who wanted to go. And I would go to these and people would pick it apart and be like, hey, what about this? What about that? The one for tournaments, it was so savage. I mean, like the spec for tournaments can get really huge and unwieldy really fast. And all these edge cases that turn it into a nightmare. And by the end of this meeting, we had savaged the poor guy who designed it so (laughs) hard. And it wasn't his fault. It's just a mess. Like there were so many questions and so many holes poked in it. Like he was literally on the brink of tears and you could just tell oh. by the end of that meeting, <laughs> this was never going to ship. I mean, like, it just wasn't going to happen. Well, and just for, for all the listeners so they're aware, what we're talking about with tournaments was it was a fully automated tournament system. Yeah. Um, so that we could just fire off tournaments, configure them, and go, and they would magically run themselves. And, yeah. Uh, it, and it had some novelty in its design, too. But go go troll Microsoft patents, and you can, you can learn more about it. <laughs> Quick note before we move on, we'll talk more about things like tournaments, saved films, observer mode, and more competitive features later on in the series. Another big pivotal change that I think was so natural that players didn't even think about it, but no games were doing at the time, was the innovation of the Y menu and to... to the, the friends list, right? The friends list. Everyone calls it the Y menu because it was on the Y button on the controller, but really it, it was the friends list yeah. because yep. when we started... Well, like when I started on Halo 2, Xbox Live had rolled out fairly recently prior to that. Mm-hmm. And the way that you went to check your friends, I think, it w- was it off the main menu for most games? There was a friends item right on the main menu of the game? You would go main menu, Xbox Live, then friends. Yeah, right. Oh, is that okay. We didn't specify at the platform level what you had to do. We just said you had to make your friends list available in your game. And we didn't do it. It wasn't like, this is old school original Xbox, so it's not like built into the system. Every game had to implement their own UI for friends list and, and all that stuff. So, and we didn't say where you had to put it really. I mean, ah, I got the, you. so it could be anywhere. Yeah. So, so all that, all that we had seen previously, the only examples we had was like you said, Andy, you'd go Xbox live and then you'd view your friends list. And we, we had this notion that your friends list should be ever present, right? At any point in time, you should always be able to invoke your friends list and, and see where your friends are. And it, it, it was all an integrated system because I also needed ways to be able to send your friends party invites or right? to invite them to your party or join your friends and, and things like that or to message them and all this cross communication. And having this uh, ever present friends list, which was on the Y button because we didn't have a dedicated guide, Xbox guide button, that, that was the solution that we came up with. So, yeah, we, we really invented this, this overlay friends list. And then we, and then the other one was messaging. Um, I want to be able to send my friend a message, and that includes game invites and other things. Because I remember writing uh, at least a first draft of a feature spec for Rich Presence and for messaging that you then 
carried across the uh, across the parking lot to the Xbox Live team. And some producer over there then yep. had the task of taking my first draft spec and turning it into a real system spec, I imagine. They hated it. They hated that <laughs> stuff. They, they all had their own ideas for what they wanted to do with Xbox Live. You know, and I'd yeah. show up and be like, hey, here's what Bunch you want. <laughs> <laughs> but at least I gave them a spec to start with. You did. Right? No, you were spectacular about that stuff, for sure. It was great. Another thing, Max, we got to talk about, of course, as we go down the list of Sultra features is clans and just how uh, important to the game they were and, and also how unique they were, especially in console multiplayer at the time. Yeah, I, I uh, clans really had a big part in my plans for Halo 2. And what we shipped ended up being a you know very, very small subset of that. But I, I remember early on, I had this notion of, uh, okay, how do, how do you make friends online? Mm-hmm. And the recent players list sort of emerged from that, right? Where you can, you know, you see this listing of recent players, so you can go send people friends requests. And the unit stats actually emerged from that too, as a way to Mm -hmm. say like, Hey, me and this guy, Andy, you know, we've played a bunch together. Maybe we should be friends. Look at our stats together, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I really wanted to have help people make friends by also allowing them to join a group. It's sort of a pre-existing group. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's where clans came about. But once I got going on it, clans ended up having this deep integration because not only was it integrated alongside the friends list that you could just bring up at the push of a button at any time in the in the game shell UI and then tab over to from your friends list to your clan list to your recent players list. Um, so it was deeply integrated in that fashion. But we ended up it ended up being integrated with the tournament system also, mm-hmm. where there was going to be separate leaderboards for uh, clans, but they weren't powered by matchmaking they're actually going to be powered by tournaments and mm-hmm. inherent in that because the tournament system was an automated tournament system. I actually linked clans where you could issue a challenge to another yes. clan and that would utilizing the tournament system would actually sort of launch and administer the uh, game that you had challenged them to play. Because when you issue a challenge, you would propose, I challenge you to, you sort of propose the parameters and then that was essentially input into the tournament system you agree on a date and time, and then you would actually have this clan match that would then feed back into your clan stats and into your clan leaderboards and everything else. So clans were, in a way, clans were more integrated with all of these systems than anything yeah. else, really. Um, but then, obviously, tournaments didn't happen, and that feature got lost. The, the other thing for clans that we planned was share, save films with your clan and other things. So mm-hmm. it would have been really awesome. I, I, and the deep integration in-game would have been freaking amazing. Yeah, what you just mentioned earlier has got to be one of my favorite cut features from Clans, the idea of composing and being able to issue a challenge. Uh, it was fully spec'd out in, in your documents, and what's cool is that you set it up the same way as a custom game, the same UI, yeah. and then you just hit send. It's kind of the equivalent of like the 1v1 lockout meme. You know, After a game ends in the post-game carnage report, someone says, 1v1 me on lockout because they just lost and yeah. they absolutely <laughs> have to get a rematch. Right, and you can see I was trying to be efficient too, right, which is we built all this interface for creating a custom game so why not just repurpose that actually you just i forgot about that aspect so when you issue a clan challenge yeah you just configure your custom game it uses the exact same interface Mm -hmm. you know first you go and you find a clan to challenge either by looking at an individual or looking at the leaderboards or knowing the name of it or your recent players you select it you say issue challenge and then it pops up the custom game configuration ui existing Mm -hmm. ui you basically custom customize your game you add some information about date, time, place, scale, right? Like one one additional UI setup screen and boom, the other side gets issued the challenge and they can accept it or decline it. Yeah. And then it's all autom- it goes through the automated tournament system. We should do that in a game someday. That, yeah. I still think it'd be awesome. I think so too. But I also love this note. It says uh, that you could have a URL for the clan and it was either a URL in the notes, word for word, a URL pointing to the clan's website or to uh, an adult website of their choosing, which which I think <laughs> nice. tells us why that that didn't quite make it in. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was just accepting the reality of the internet. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, uh, not surprising to see that the URL online didn't make it in. Yeah. So Max, let's go ahead and talk more about matchmaking and the big decision between a traditional server browser that could be found on most PC games at the time. Yeah. Versus, of course, the new idea of matchmaking playlists. There was definitely an evolution there, and I think we naturally started thinking we'd have a server list and we'd have matchmaking. I do remember actually doing a lot of early thinking about matchmaking and and reaching a couple conclusions that I think were really pivotal. One was I did a lot of analysis to try and estimate what 
size population we needed to make matchmaking work. I remember having a bit of an epiphany on that because I, I'd been doing a bunch of modeling and it was like, okay, in theory, maybe we can have a custom game browser and we can have matchmaking. And then I had this one moment where I realized like, I'm actually estimating our population. It was all a guess because we didn't know what game sales would be like, right? So mm -hmm. I had to I had to start conservative. My systems are going to have to survive whether the game's a huge hit or just a moderate hit. There was no survive if it's a failure, right? Mm -hmm. But but I always had to use a conservative estimate. And then I I looked at it and I realized at one point that everything I was planning was at peak population, Oof. and that you know I really need to think about what things look like at you know the low point because even though we knew we were going to be a worldwide game we also knew that we were going to be way bigger in the west and we were going to be way bigger in the u.s right that was kind of a given mm -hmm. so then i had to go and think all right wh what's the matchmaking experience going to be for people when our population is at its minimum not its maximum and when i did that i had a moment of panic when i realized this entire system is just going to die the wait times are going to be atrocious it's going to be a horrible experience wow. and it's going to be miserable if we don't essentially force all players to go into matchmaking. And then the other thing that was really instrumental, I knew this from the get-go, was we're doing something really different and really new with matchmaking. And naturally, people that are used to having all this control and all this choice in the game mode and the map and everything, there's there's going to be a backlash. Even within Bungie, there were a bunch of people that internally was, you know, there was internal backlash on the development team even. Mm -hmm. So I knew that if we don't make this essentially mandatory and we give people the old way of doing things, there's just no way we're ever going to get critical mass on this new way of doing things with matchmaking. And we really have to rip off that Band-Aid. Um, and I think I already knew that going in, that we kind of we would benefit massively by ripping off that Band-Aid and not having a custom game browser and just forcing everyone that played online either go into a custom game with your friends, which we still supported, but if you want to play with strangers, you must use matchmaking. I, I knew we had to rip off that Band-Aid, but then that realization about how horrible it would be at you know, minimum population versus maximum, that pushed me over the edge. And I was, I was all in knowing that we had to do, if we were going to do matchmaking, we had to go, you know, we had to do exclusively matchmaking and no custom browser. And that thinking might've happened before you got engaged on all of it, Sam. Was I already committed? I want to say <laughs> that we did like an alpha test with this and, and we experienced some really long waits through matchmaking because there's only, you know, I don't know, 30 of us or something doing these tests from home. Do you, does that sound familiar at all? Do we have an alpha test? Oh yeah. Yeah. We did an alpha and a beta, but those yeah. decisions were, those decisions were made like a year long before that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Long before that. Th those were just valid. Those were just validation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. On the topic of matchmaking, there's one fairly hidden note in one of the documents that says after choosing one of these playlists, the squad leader will be shown the contents of the playlist and allowed to deselect the entries they prefer not to play. <laughs> this is not a guarantee, just a preference. Of course, this feature ultimately did not end up shipping, and I think it was to the benefit of the game because Halo 2 multiplayer had so much map and game type variety, but it's interesting that there was originally a thought to offer some preferences uh, on that front. Yeah, I, wanted, I, you know, I was trying to figure out, like, how, do, how can we give people some agency without violating the system mm -hmm. and, and fragmenting it further? And that, that was an attempt to do that, which is to say, okay, it won't be a matchmaking filter, but once we match you with a group, why not allow people to, to have express their preferences? And it's not a guarantee, but we, and we actually, I ended up never really specking it out and never implementing it for Halo 2, but I did implement it for Halo 3, right. where you had a preference, a different implementation, but we actually did implement that for Halo 3 matchmaking. Preferences, yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. yeah. I think it was a wise decision in the end for Halo 2, because as we'll talk about in, um, in our next episode for maps, I think we probably would have seen a lot of lockout and coagulation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. They had these technical certification requirements right out the gate. You had to do these things. And one of the ones that they had was you have to have that. There was a notion clearly among the amongst the live team that matchmaking a game browser can be inaccessible. Just a quick note here for context. You just heard Max mention technical certification requirements or TCRs, as Max and Sam will call them in a moment. These are the things that Xbox as a platform mandates that a game developer has to do in order to pass Xbox certification. So if a game doesn't meet certain TCRs, the game can fail cert or fail Xbox certification and not be allowed to release. So that's what's being discussed here, the technical requirements that Halo 2 had to meet in order to pass Xbox certification. 
So we need something more accessible in addition to an in-game browser. Right. So so all, the, the way that they expressed that, though, was really simple. There was a requirement. Your game must offer two options to the player. Yep. Do you remember their names? Quick match and Optimatch. Of yes. course I do. <laughs> Such a nightmare, right? So then you go in and you look at the requirement and you say, you know, quick match must get players quickly into a game with a you know limited number of selections, preferably one. Yeah, it was like one. three button presses or something like that. Yeah, yeah, like that, within right? three button presses, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and Optimatch, they can have more control. Mm-hmm. And that was it. That was the requirement. But what you actually do, there was no standardization of what quick match meant. Right. And Optimatch, like what, what a developer actually does with that, it was really anything you wanted. So I basically shoehorned those into the matchmaking system that I was envisioning. I was like, all right, yeah, sure. I can make a quick match, right? It's just yeah. going to pick a playlist for you. And by the way, Optimatch, we don't really need as many choices as you guys thought right. because it's going to be pretty damn quick too. Just yeah. pick your playlist and go. I think and we ended yeah. up waiving all those all those TCRs for you guys. I, no, I had it. I had quick match Did and you? Optimatch. So it's so funny you guys say that because if you think about Halo 2's menu, UI, UX, and even Bungie vernacular, it's so consistent across Bungie.net, across the title, in-game menus, things like that. And I always remember thinking, even as a 15-year-old kid, I'm like, Quick Match and OptiMatch are the weirdest names, and they don't (laughs) feel like they fit in this video game. You know what I mean? Right. There you go. They don't. Now you know. Yeah. Yeah. That TCR never got waived. I know I I got your help to wave a bunch of others, Sam, but that was Oh yeah. We waved a lot. I worked with it. I figured you can't, you know, you can't fight them all. You gotta pick your battles. Yeah. (laughs) They had a vision for how things should work and yours was just way better and didn't really fit. And it just I think it took a little while to get them to come around to uh, agreeing with that. Yeah. And the (laughs) fact that they were open to hearing from them and ultimately able to change course, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. Oh yeah. That leads us really well into, Max, the ranking system, which is still touted as one of the most beloved and favorite kind of ranking systems players have played on, on console or otherwise. Where does even the, the conversation start on, you know, there's so much documentation on peak level progression curves and iconography and <laughs> modified ELO and uh, sticky ranks. There, there's so much there. Yeah, yeah. That, the ranking system is interesting because uh, to, to a large extent, I just kind of pulled that out of my butt. <laughs> <laughs> and what I, what I mean by that is I had I had some experience as a player and, and sort of community manager, if you will, with uh, the myth myth had a ranking system and it had these tiers and you get these icons. And so I had the, the sort of the firsthand experience, but that was the sum total of my experience ha- having really experienced an online ranking system. Um, and, it, and it had some strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. So I remember when I was thinking, it definitely convinced me we need a ranking system, right? That's that stuff. You know, it's very addictive chasing rank, right? So I knew we needed a ranking system and there are absolutely players that are competitive. So I decided up front, we're going to have unranked playlists and we'll have ranked playlists, right? But what should the ranking system be? And I remember, I remember having a conversation with a guy named Michael Evans, um, who was our, one of our engineering leads. You remember, you remember Evans, uh, Sam? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Evans was a massive Blizzard fan. And anytime I had any thoughts about anything, Michael's answer was we should do it like Blizzard does it, Right. That was actually the real genesis for matchmaking was Michael pointing me to what we should go check out what Blizzard's doing. So uh, on the rankings also, I remember having a little bit of a conversation with Michael and talking about um, talking about an ELO system. So for those that don't know, ELO is the chess ranking system. Mm-hmm. Right? ELO RPAD invented this chess ranking system. And the funny thing is I, I didn't play chess and I'd never even heard of ELO prior to Evans pointing me to it. So I went on the internet, went to probably Wikipedia or something even back then, and I looked up ELO rankings, and I'm like, okay, that's uh, that's interesting. I, I I get it. I see what he's talking about, but that doesn't really work for me because I want to ELO start basically starts you in the middle of the ranks, you know, and then over time as we gather data, we'll hone in. It's actually more like true skill, ironically. Yeah. We'll hone in better on your rank. But I was like, all right, but I want a progression system where everyone starts at level one and tries to you know, claw over their opponents to get to the top. So I basically, and this is the pulled out of my butt part, I basically said, okay, well, there's a way we can use an ELO-like system with the ELO-like point exchange, Mm -hmm. but start everyone at zero and start everyone at the beginning. And I just, I just made it up. I just made up this system and uh, spec'd it out and shared it around internally and said, hey, everybody, here's, here's what I'm thinking for our ranking system. It's going to have levels and it's going to have, you know, these point trades and everything else. And, uh, and what I spec'd is what we shipped. I mean, we tweaked it along the way and put it through an alpha and a beta test. And what I spec is what we shipped. And then I hear today people talking about what an amazing experience that was. Or I'm like, I, I mean, it's great to hear, uh, but it's not like it was founded on uh, 
some kind of deep knowledge of online game ranking yeah. systems. Right. I don't know, Sam, do you remember anything about the ranking system? What I remember is like when I first joined the Xbox team and they were specking out live, they had ELO built in as like the default. It was going to like integrate directly with leaderboards. Um, and we were telling all these developers that ELO was the way to do it. Um, oh. And I had never heard of ELO either. And, and most of the developers I talked to hadn't. And I think a lot of games did ship um, with their own internal kind of ELO system. Mm -hmm. But isn't it interesting, Sam, to hear all these years later, and I get this all the time, there's still people that point to the ranking system from Halo 2 mm -hmm. as the the pinnacle of these you know in-game ranking systems, which is just mind-boggling. Well, it's 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 mind-boggling, but really, you got to take a step back, Max, and think about what what's been accomplished here, because like your your implementation of parties and friends list and all that that's still pervasive today, and it's yeah. what eighteen years later. Yeah, that's crazy. I wish the ranking system I did was more pervasive because people <laughs> keep complaining, saying, why isn't it more like Halo? And the funny thing is, I actually put an article and it's still up there. Bungie still hosts it to this day. It's from when we did the uh, beta test. Yep. We were trying to encourage people to cheat or break the system. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this article that actually laid out in explicit detail exactly how the ranking system works. Mm -hmm. And there was no secret. Like it was full disclosure and because... We hoped that by having full disclosure, it would make it easier for people to cheat. To try and game right? it, yeah. To try and game the system. Yep. So we put it out there. Nobody ever successfully gamed the system or cheated, right? It, I don't know. Maybe on the tech side, somebody figured something out. But to my knowledge, it was essentially bulletproof. And then we shipped it. And uh, and then after we shipped, I was like, gosh, that article I wrote for internal consumption, we might as well just make it public for everybody. Sure. And it's still hosted at BungieNet today. That's awesome. One of the great things about that article, too, is you guys had listed like 10 different prize categories for, I think it was the title of the internal Microsoft email was needed rank obsessed, cheating. cheating. Rank obsessed yes, something. Exactly. That, a word that I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing because you guys had all these prize categories and you were going to name a portion of a map after someone. Wow. Oh, I forgot about that part. There was bungee gear on the line. Oh, but nobody got any. No one got anything. Nobody, yeah. Seriously, nobody successfully game that system so you know and, and and you know after we shipped andy people did successfully game the system in a sense because the one thing that i did not predict that well there, there were two things there was standby on mm -hmm. the modem that just mm -hmm. killed us that we hadn't technically we had not we had not predicted and adequately protected against mm -hmm. um you know, to a degree we had but not adequately and the other one was account resets because there's 50 bucks barrier of entry to a new xbox live account we just thought that you know, no one's going to be just having a brand new account willy nilly, or you know, no one of significant numbers. But then the Xbox Live team was giving out these free three month trial cards, like they were candy with every game, and anybody that including wanted, including Halo Two. Yeah, yeah, perpetually had the free account, and I did not account for that, and mm -hmm. that ended up. It, you probably know better than I do, but those ended up being like these vehicles for cheating that we yep. we just didn't predict or couldn't maybe couldn't predict, but certainly didn't predict. Mm -hmm. Yep. That hampered us across live for years to come. I worked on all the Call of Duty titles as well, same kind of capacity. And it was, mm -hmm. we just got slaughtered um, on cheating and hackery forever. It was yep. always a problem. And giving out free accounts was just... Not a good idea. Yeah, so was, yeah, so terrible. I was always curious if you were bothered by the fact that at the platform level, we sort of hijacked your terminology and called our voice parties parties. And then you have this ambiguity around, join my party. This, you... You there's like a whole nother episode is the and you're not even aware or no one over there of how unbelievably miserable you all made me on Halo Three, unbelievably yeah. miserable. I, I I've told I've said publicly before decisions that the live team made mm -hmm. uh, with the 360 and whatever version of live that was mm -hmm. they effectively killed all the innovation that I wanted to do of the evolution and innovation of the, all the systems from Halo Two because I spent all my time just figuring out how to have feature parity with Halo 2. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it was brutal. Yeah. But that's another, we'll save that for another day. <laughs> I was going to say, this is the second episode in a row, Max, where we've teed up the <laughs> Halo 3 series. So. Yeah, yeah, apparently. Just saying. <laughs> One other thing I caught in the documents that was interesting to find is that originally, around 2004, there were only really two minor differences. The first of the ranking system originally only went up to 25. And then also the 1 through 50 icons that are now so legendary and iconic uh, were originally grunts, jackals, different elite variants. And then level 4 was a blue grunt. The the profit <laughs> hierarch was the level 25. And uh, it's interesting to also think back to the fact that you ultimately did just ship with the 1 through 50 icons that became so well known. Yeah, I think that the Myth games had 25 levels. So I think when I started, I, I think I started with 25 levels. 
and the myth games also had named um, every every rank had a name, so you could be a king or a prince or an emperor. I think those might have been the top three, um, and it, it gave you a common language. So when I was doing this for Halo, I just wanted to do the same thing and have a common lingo that you could refer it, mm-hmm. you know, to any given rank, as opposed to saying it's rank twenty three. You could actually have a nice friendly name for it, right? That's where that came about. And then somewhere along the lines, I ended up deciding to go with 50 levels instead. I don't actually remember why. And then somewhere along the lines, we ditched the friendly names. Maybe 50 was just too many. Yeah. But yeah, there, there was no like big aha moment or anything there. That was just a natural evolution. You asked Dave Canland because he, he had to make all those rank icons. So at some point, Dave probably made a decision about what he was going to do. Sure. And of course, he still saved some of the cool icons, you know, Comet, et cetera, yep. for the later levels. Well, Comet, oh, that's what it was. Comet was left over from Myth. There could be only one. The top ranked player was the Comet, if I recall. So that was actually carried over from the Myth games. Hmm. For both you guys, is there a single feature that you're proudest of uh, that you were able to, to, to get into the product? That's a that's such a hard question for me because so all these features were so tightly integrated. Yeah, right? like that's exactly they can't they, they don't exist in a vacuum. Parties and matchmaking and the friends list and every rankings and everything. I I think the one thing that the one thing that I'm probably happiest about is parties though. Yeah, because I feel like parties is of everything that we did on the live feature set. Parties is the most um, the most original invention of them all. I know when I came up with parties, I had never seen any game do that before. The whole idea of a party, which I know the Xbox Live has now morphed into its own thing. Yep. But a lot so much invention is evolution, right? You're building you're building on the back of what's come before. And that is certainly the case most of the time. Like our matchmaking system, it may have been first on the console, but it was absolutely inspired by things that had come before. Parties, absolutely not the case. Parties really sprung from the ether. Yep. fully formed, so to speak. They're also the hardest to, to figure out for that same reason. I don't know, Sam, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking exactly the same thing, but I also don't feel any personal credit um, for those things. I mean, these, you know, I, I facilitated helping them get done, but it wasn't my creative vision. Um, so it's, I lay that at your feet, Max. That's no, That was you. you. So some, of, some of them were, that, that one certainly was. So, But, you know, a team effort and all the good ideas in the world don't matter if you can't execute on them. So appreciate the help. Yeah, it was, it was fun times for all of us, I think. Do you remember specifically any features that came in super hot or the hottest that almost didn't make it into Halo 2? There were certainly a lot that came in hot into the game, but most of that was on the campaign side. Look, how about this? The entire campaign. <laughs> but, on the, on the, uh, <laughs> but on the multiplayer side, I, I, that actually wasn't the case because I was pretty good at just kind of playing with the hand I was dealt, whether that be limited resources or, or whatnot. And we had a there was a monumental engineering effort, um, both internally at Bungie, but then also we actually pulled in a bunch of other engineers to help from other game de- Microsoft game developers and the Xbox Live team also. And everyone sort of made me aware that there was really no room for error and I really had to have my shit together. Um, so, so I put a lot of work into making sure that everything was really buttoned up and done on time. And then Chris Butcher especially was a huge proponent um, of doing an alpha test and doing a beta test, um, which we never done before. And it had never even happened on the Xbox, Sam, if you recall. Yeah. So just the infrastructure to be able to do an alpha test and beta test, the, you know, we had to partner with the live team to put that infrastructure in place, Mm -hmm. but because we had those deadlines always looming over us, we just, we just sort of, you know, worked within our means and designed around those deadlines and then had this bizarre experience at the end of the game because we gold mastered when we were supposed to gold master and we finished everything. And then we had like a month to go. And meanwhile, the campaign team was scrambling like nobody's business and cramming everything in at the last minute. And it was, everything was on fire. For instance, our lead environment artist slash level designer, Chris Carney from multiplayer, he spent the past, the last month actually chipping in primarily on the uh, campaign side wow. because we actually had all of our stuff wrapped up and done. So yeah, we, we, there wasn't anything that came in hot. The only thing that came in hot was inadvertent, which was at the last minute. Who I didn't know, I did not know this, but uh, Jamie and Jason, in the last week before they gold mastered, they redid all the weapon balance in the game, and it totally borked all the weapons for multiplayer. And we shipped that way because nobody told us. We didn't know, and we thought it was all in the bag. Wow. Then we had to patch very very quickly because it turned out uh, they had nerfed grenade damage and the. The holy trinity as you know between melee and weapons and grenade they actually broke it 
uh, like days, literally days before they gold mastered. And we never knew because we were done and we had wrapped up like weeks earlier. So yeah, uh, yeah, that was painful. That was really hard. Did, didn't did co-op uh, multiplayer, like uh, Xbox Live co-op almost get cut too? Wasn't that close? I don't, I don't remember. Oh God, I feel like it was really close. I was not involved in it at all, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. There was so much that uh, came in on completely on fire not in a yeah. good way <laughs> i think that was one of them and it was close to being cut because yeah. like there were issues with players running too far ahead of the other player and things yeah. like that that would break the game i would not be surprised it, it's interesting yeah i i was so immersed in the things i was doing the multiplayer online that so much of the rest of the game development like the sandbox i was immersed in because we were we were the test bed for weapons mm -hmm. but like so much of the campaign and the narrative and single player level design and everything i just I mean, I, I didn't have time. I, yeah. I mean, as you can tell, I had a lot on my plate. Um, yep. Apparently, we had a lot of live meetings, and uh, you and I were <laughs> yeah. emailing all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed this today, uh, and I want to thank you both not only for joining me, but also the industry-shaping contributions from you and your entire teams uh, that resulted from the features that we talked about today. Thank you. I had a great time uh, reliving the old memories. Yeah, reminiscing. Th thanks for hosting this, Andy and Sam. It was uh, it was actually really great catching up. It just it actually reminded me of how much fun it actually was working together with you all yeah. those years ago. Thanks a lot, Max. That was really fun. I appreciate it. All right, guys, be sure to tune into the next episode where we'll cover design documents and paper designs from Halo 2 maps, both the ones that made the cut and those that did not. And scene. <laughs> Episode 2 of Halo 2 Artifacts was written, produced, and edited by me, Andy bravo Dodinsky. Special thanks go out to Max Hoberman and the entire Halo 2 team at Bungie, as well as Sam Charchian and the early Xbox Live team. I'd also like to thank Jay Goldberg, Dave Lohmiller, Tahir Hasanjekic, and Sidney Goodman. Music is used under license from Epidemic Sound. Halo is a copyright of the Microsoft Corporation, and Halo 2 Artifacts was created under Microsoft's game content usage rules. It is not endorsed by or affiliated with Microsoft. Thanks for listening. When I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At Christmas 1983, my parents got me an television. And, uh... <laughs> hey, everyone. It's Bravo. Just wanted to say a quick thank you for all the support on Halo 2 Artifacts. We can't believe it, but the show debuted last week as the number one gaming podcast in the U.S., Canada, and Australia on Apple Podcasts. So thanks so much for checking out the show. And we hope you love the rest of the series.